بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so we had finished the issue of uh, Dajjal and now we move on to the next of the major signs and that is the issue of Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the issue of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is actually for our modern times I would say one of the most, if not the most problematic of the signs of Judgment Day. And it has caused many of our youth to question, to doubt. I myself have met people that have actually left Islam because of these types of tales. And we have to be honest and frank and not pretend as if this doesn't exist. Perhaps some of you are not accustomed to hearing people speak like this, but my philosophy is different. We are dealing with a crisis of people leaving our faith, our own children, our own young men and women. And of the reasons why is that we are not answering some of these issues that they bring and we dismiss them. And I myself have discussed many of these issues with these types of people. And one of them, not the only one, but one of them is Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So we have to be very clear and frank and think critically even as we look at our tradition. So let us begin from the beginning. Who are Ya'juj and Ma'juj? And do we, what does the Quran and Sunnah say about them? The issue of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is something that doesn't just occur in the Hadith. It is explicit in the Quran. So Allah Azza wa Jal mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj in the Qur'an. Therefore, it is pretty clear that this is not something that you can say, oh, it's only found in one hadith. No, it is found in many a hadith. But even more importantly, it is found in the Qur'an itself. Where in the Qur'an? In two specific verses, only two. Only twice in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The first of them is Surah Al-Kahf. And at the very end of Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the issue of Dhul Qarnayn, Jazakallah khair. The story of Dhul Qarnayn. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ Now, this is an entire lecture and an entire tafsir altogether. I do not have time to go into Dhul Qarnayn and the tafsir of Surah Kahf, even though it's very juicy, maybe another time. What we do know, Dhul Qarnayn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we gave him power in this world and we allowed him a path everywhere. And he went to the easternmost, he went to the westernmost. There are stories mentioned in the Quran about Dhul Qarnayn. He was a just king, he thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He found people of all different types and persuasions. And then the final one that is mentioned, the final group of people, حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَ بَيْنَ السَّدَّيْنِ When he came to essentially a valley, there's two mountain slopes coming here. وَجَدَ مِن دُونِهِمَا قَوْمًا He found a group of people. لَا يَكَادُونَ يَفْقَهُونَ قَوْلًا They did not understand Dhul Qarnayn. Dhul Qarnayn did not understand them. In other words, this was a civilization that had no middle ground. In the good old days, once upon a time, before Google Translate, how did people translate from one another? There were people, intermediaries, who had traveled to both lands. Inevitably, you would find somebody who spoke Latin and Arabic, who spoke, you know, this language and that language. You would find somebody. Dhul Qarnayn went to such a faraway land that the language of those people and the language of Dhul Qarnayn had no middle ground. So Allah is mentioning this is a far-flung civilization from where Dhul Qarnayn came from. So how then did they communicate when there is no language? They communicated with signs. You know when you're in a tourist in a different land, in a strange land, and you have no language whatsoever, you are forced to communicate with your hands. And mashallah, you can communicate so much with your hands, right? When you really have to, you can figure things out. So they are communicating with their symbols, with their gestures. And so they say that uh, This is the first mention of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. They say this group of people, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they are wreaking havoc in this world. So Dhul Qarnayn, you are a mighty king, you are a powerful person, 
We will give you something. We will give you money, whatever is the symbol for money, and you build a wall. You protect us from those people. O Dhul Qarnayn, you are clearly a man of intellect and power, a mighty king. You have a civilization we do not have. You have strength we do not have. So we want you to do something to protect us. So Dhul Qarnayn has gone to the furthermost regions of the world and there is a group of people even beyond that region. This is called Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And this civilization is saying, we want protection, we'll pay you to build this barrier between us and them. So Dhul Qarnayn says, I don't need your money. I don't need your money. I have plenty. What are you going to give me? Rather, I understand these people are evil. So Dhul Qarnayn sympathized with this other nation against Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So Dhul Qarnayn said, okay, you know, these people are really bad, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, I'll help you. What do I need from you? فَأَعِينُونِي بِقُوَّةٍ أَجْعَلْ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَهُمْ رَدَمًا I need your strength. I need manual power. I know what to do. I have the brains for it, but I need the bronze. I need the people. So Allah Azza wa Jal then mentions, that they took big bellows of furnace and iron and copper and they made a special type of barrier and they put these people, uh, they, 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 they used these bellows of the furnaces on a massive scale and they made an iron barrier that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, فَمَسْطَاعُوا أَنْ يَظْهَرُوهُ وَمَسْطَاعُوا لَهُ نَقْبَةً Neither could they climb over the wall nor could they come underneath it nor could they bore a hole between it. So it is an effective uh, barrier. قَالَ هَذَا رَحْمَةٌ مِنْ رَبِّ Dhul Qarnayn, when he saw what he had done, he said, this is from Allah. Allah has blessed me. Allah has given me this. It's not from me. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, either Dhul Qarnayn or Allah is speaking. We don't know which one. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي Most likely it is Dhul Qarnayn or an angel or somebody is saying this. But this wall is temporary. When the command of Allah comes, then this wall will be of no use. It will be gone. وَتَرَكْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَمُوجُوا فِي بَعْضٍ And on that day, these groups will be like, like waves, just intermixing amongst one another, and the trumpet will be blown. So this is the first mention of the Qarnayn, and it deals with the wall, uh, uh, sorry, the first mention of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and it deals with the wall that was built by Dhul Qarnayn. Uh, the next mention of uh, Ya'juj and Ma'juj is Surat Al-Anbiya verses 92 to 97. Surat Al-Anbiya verses 92 to 97 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran regarding Judgment Day حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ Until finally Ya'juj and Ma'juj will be allowed out. Futihat. They will be allowed out and they are going to be pouring down from every single you know, slope, from every mountain they're going to be coming. And judgment will now be asunder, will now be well close. So Ya'juj and Ma'juj are right before judgment day. This is pretty clear in the Quran. In Surah Al-Kahf, over here, and the inevitable hour is coming. So twice in the Quran, Allah mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj, both of them linking it directly to Judgment Day, right before Judgment Day. Now, by the way, uh, who is Dhul Qarnayn? Dhul Qarnayn is an enigmatic figure and uh, most of our, some of our medieval commentators and then especially uh, the most famous translator of the Quran of the previous uh, century, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, uh, whose impact in the translation was well known. All of us who grew up in the 70s, 80s, 90s, we know Abdullah Yusuf Ali's translation as being the one that had the most impact even though long story but uh, it wasn't very accurate number one number two can you believe this is a completely tangent Abdul Yusuf Ali couldn't speak Arabic properly there's another point he plagiarized it but that's a whole different story not related to our uh, topic here nonetheless yani his translation went viral and in his translation and his commentary he mentions that Dhul Qarnayn is who does he mention Alexander all of you know this okay he mentioned Dhul Qarnayn is Alexander the Great and it kind of spread amongst the masses. And this is what happens, subhanAllah, how thoughts spread, even if they're incorrect. And so many people thought Dhul Qarnayn is Alexander, but this is really 
almost 100% wrong for many reasons. Most obviously is that we know a lot about Alexander the Great. We know a lot about him. And he was not a believer in Allah, he was a pagan. He worshipped the idols. And Allah praises Dhul Qarnayn as being a worshipper. And Allah praises Dhul Qarnayn as being a righteous person. And Allah never praises paganism. And Allah never praises someone in this manner. And Allah Azza wa mentions Dhul Qarnayn says, Qala hadha rahmatun min Rabbi. So Alexander, really almost impossible. Uh, some modern commentators have said that it is the uh, the Persian King Cyrus, uh, King Cyrus, who ruled from around 600 to 530 BC. So we're talking about 2,600 years ago, the Persian King Cyrus. And Cyrus, they say he's a candidate because he ruled over perhaps the largest empire the world has ever seen, or maybe the second or third largest. You know, there have been this massive empires. Alexander the Great probably did rule over the most largest empire, but temporarily. The Muslims, by the way, ruled over the largest for the longest period of time. But that's a different thing. Alexander, for a period of time, had more, but it fizzled out with his death. The benefit or the beauty of Islam is that wherever the Muslims went, Islam remained. And Islam and the Muslim civilization was the largest, but it wasn't unified uh, as solid, if you like, as it was under Alexander. So they say Cyrus. But firstly, there are a number of things that don't match up. And secondly, once again, Cyrus was a clear-cut pagan. There is a third theory that I personally am very sympathetic to. But these are just theories in the end of the day. If you don't like it or you like it, it doesn't matter. It's just my opinion or the opinion of some modern scholars. If Dhul Qarnayn were a historic figure, what do I mean by historic? I mean somebody whom we know. Because it is always possible that Dhul Qarnayn is pre-history pre-recorded history because recorded history begins around 4,000 years ago before that we don't really have records before that it's just unknown it's a big black box perhaps the Qarnayn is of that time frame Allah knows as for recorded history it goes back around 4,000 roughly 4,000 years or a bit more than that and we know pretty much all of the massive empires and the great kings of that time frame. If Dhul Qarnayn was one of the kings of this era, then we should know about him in terms of recorded history. Humanity would have known of these types of great kings who have conquered large swaths of the earth. So another candidate that I am personally very sympathetic to is the Persian Emperor Darius. The Persian Emperor Darius who ruled 550 to 486 uh, BC and Darius ruled over most of the known world at that time, most of what we now call Asia Minor, the Caucasus, the Balkans, Central Asia, even Egypt, North Africa. He had a massive empire and he himself traveled to the furthest east and the furthest west. And he led expeditions in, in his entire kingdom. And he fought against the Egyptians, he fought against the Chinese, he fought against, or the, the people of that region, call them what you will, but he fought against all of these people. And what is interesting about Darius, unlike like Cyrus and definitely unlike Alexander, Darius was a monotheist. In contrast to the people before him and after him, we know from the books of history that Darius was an ardent monotheist. He was a strict believer in one God. He was beloved to his people. He had the reputation of being uh, a just king. And we have records of Darius. We have inscriptions to this day of Darius in which he is saying, I am the king, you know, uh, Darius and whatnot, uh, whom God has given power, whom God has bestowed power to. In other words, هذا رحمة من ربي, literally. God has blessed me with this power. It is very rare to find an ancient king who basically, I mean, Fir'aun said, أنا ربكم الأعلى, right? It is very rare to find an ancient king who is saying, look, I am a king, but the one above is the one who made me the king. He is the one who gave this to me. So, and, and by the way, there's also a, a very enigmatic inscription of Darius in which he is depicted as having two horns as well. So that kind of, yani, adds a little bit of, of, of spice, you know, uh, to the uh, whole mix there that Darius seems to be a likely candidate and he was an ardent believer. Now, some can say, for those of you who know your history, but Darius was a Zoroastrian. And we say, well, there was no Islam per se at this point in time. We're talking 2,000 years ago. And uh, uh, Darius believed in the one supreme God that they called Ahura Mazda. And that was their name for them, but it was one God that they believed in. So Allah knows best we are not 100% sure in any case and it is also possible that 
Zul Qarnayn could be somebody in recorded history whom we don't know. But that seems a bit difficult to swallow for someone like me. But those of you who wish to, they can do that. But uh, you, you have two main options in my opinion. Either it's one of these historic figures or it's pre-recorded history. But then the issue comes again to, to make the, the issue more enigmatic. Generally speaking, Quranic history is recorded history. Yani only Nuh and some are pre pre history otherwise Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq the rest of them they're basically in the time frame that most uh, civilization is known so Allah Ta'ala knows best in any case Dhul Qarnayn is called Dhul Qarnayn according to our tradition either because he had two streaks of white hair or because he wore a helmet with two horns and Darius is depicted as two horns or because he went to the east and the west so the Qarn here is east and west so the owner of the east and the uh, west so this is the notion of Dhul Qarnayn now we're going to get to Ya'juj and Ma'juj before I talk about my own understandings and whatnot let's see what else is mentioned so this is Ya'juj and Ma'juj in the Quran we don't have much about them other than they seem to be a race of savages. They seem to be a race that is barbaric. Killing, looting, plundering. And Dhul Qarnayn, who has never met them, is sympathetic that these people are bad. He just wants to build a wall to protect these strangers from Dhul Qarnayn. So, what does the Ahadith say? The Ahadith are numerous. In fact, in the six books of Hadith, there are around a dozen narrations of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So it's not a small amount. There are around a dozen. Around. Bukhari and Muslim have around six or seven. So it is mentioned in the most authentic books, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The concept of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is found in our tradition. And of these Ahadith, is the hadith in Sahih Muslim where our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said 10 are the major signs of Judgment Day and he mentions Ad-Dukhan, Ad-Dajjal, ad the rising of the sun in the west, the descent of Isa ibn Maryam and Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So number 6 on this list mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim. So he mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj as being one of the 10 major signs. In another hadith, Sahih Bukhari, this is the Bukhari hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually the Mutafaq Ali Bukhari Muslim. The Prophet said that uh, he quoted the verse in the Quran that Ya Ayyunas Takurabakum in Zalzala Tasati Shayun Azim Yauma Tarona Tadhalu Kulu Murdiatin Amma Ardaat Wataba Ukulu Dati Hamn and Hamla Watara Nasa Sukara Wama Humbu Sukara Walakin Adal Adabalahi Shadid. This is the beginning of Surah Hajj and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in it that this is judgment day that all mankind Fear your Lord. For indeed, the earthquake of Judgment Day is something to be terrified. On that day, you will see people. The woman will, the, the the mother will neglect her breastfeeding child, and people will walk around as if they are drunk. But they are not drunk. But the punishment of Allah is severe. And the Prophet quoted this ayah, and then he said that. When will this happen? When will people be so terrified? When Allah will announce to the angels or to Adam that, O oh Adam, take the people of Jahannam to Jahannam. And so from every thousand, 999 will go to Jahannam. The Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, with those odds, how can we be safe? If every thousand, nine hundred and ninety-nine are going to go to Jahannam, how can we be safe? What is the statistical chance of us winning? And so the Prophet wasallam said, I give you good news. For every one of you, there will be a thousand of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So this hadith, which is in Bukhari, is saying the quantity of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is astronomical beyond what we can even comprehend. Hadith in Sahih in uh, Musnad Imam Ahmad that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that you complain that there is no enemy. Some of the younger Sahaba are wanting to have a fight. You're complaining we're not fighting. But you shall continue fighting. There will always be qital once the fitna begins that happened with the time of Uthman radiallahu an. There will always be fighting until Ya'juj and Ma'juj come. 
So hadith is explicit that fighting will continue until Ya'juj and Ma'juj and then the Prophet ﷺ described them. They shall have faces that are flat, they shall have eyes that are narrow, they shall have hair that is yellowish and they shall descend from every single plane. Now, important to note, you shall fight until Ya'juj and Ma'juj. He didn't say you will fight Ya'juj and Ma'juj. We will learn you, we will not fight Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Ya'juj and Ma'juj are not fightable. Is that a correct verb? Is that a correct noun? Masdar. They are not capable to be fought. Let us be more precise and pedantic. You cannot fight Ya'juj and Ma'juj. We will not be fighting Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Fighting will continue until Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Which also means what? After Ya'juj and Ma'juj, no fighting. So Ya'juj and Ma'juj is the final frontier after which there will be no fitan. There will be no fitan after Ya'juj and Ma'juj. This also shows that Ya'juj and Ma'juj will be of the very, very, very last fitan to take place. Because after Ya'juj and Ma'juj, there will be no more major fitan for the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ said as well, another hadith. So right now, what am I doing? I'm narrating to you Quran and Sunnah. I'm narrating to you our sources. Then we will pause and go back and see what we can derive from those sources. Okay, because we need to really think deeply. And in all likelihood, we will have to do a part two for Ya'juj and Ma'juj because there is a lot of material to digest and discuss. Our Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ I swear by him in whose hands is my soul. You shall continue to perform hajj and umrah. And you will continue to cultivate and plant trees even after Ya'juj and Ma'juj. This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. So in Sahih Bukhari, we learn another interesting fact. Ya'juj and Ma'juj is not the end of the Ummah. What is the purpose of this hadith? O oh, Ummah, you will not be destroyed. O oh, Muslims, you are going to be here, don't worry. No external enemy will eliminate you. This is a prediction and it has been true throughout all of history and it will continue to be true. Our Prophet made three du'as to Allah and he said, Allah gave me two of them and he denied me one. Remember this? We went over it a few weeks ago. The second one was, O oh Allah, do not allow my ummah to be destroyed by an external enemy. And Allah said, I've given it to you. Never will an external enemy decimate and eliminate the ummah, even if they eliminate parts of the ummah. The whole ummah will never be gotten rid of by an external enemy. So the Prophet ﷺ is giving good tidings. You're worried about the Quraysh, you're worried about this and that, don't worry. I am telling you, I swear by Allah, not only will you survive, you will do hajj and umrah. You'll retain your religion. And you will cultivate, you'll retain your dunya. Even after Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So, even Ya'juj and Ma'juj are not the end of Muslims. There shall be Umrah and Hajj, and there shall be cultivation and planting even after Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So, this is another interesting thing that we derive. In another hadith, Muttafaq Ali Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ entered in upon some of our mothers, some of his wives, and he was agitated. He was concerned. He was worried. And he put his finger and his thumb together in a circle. He put his finger and his thumb in a circle. And he said that, لا إله إلا الله ويل للعرب من شر قد قترب لا إله إلا الله ويل للعرب من شر قد قترب La ilaha illallah, woe to the Arabs. And this means Muslims because at that time all the Muslims were Arabs. Woe to the Muslims, woe to the Arabs from an evil that has now come very close. What is this evil? Umm Salama asked, what is this evil? He said, today a hole of this size, hence the ishara, has been opened up from the wall of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Now this hadith is muttafaq alayh, the highest level of authenticity for us. Today, a hole of this size has been opened up from the wall of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Umm Salama said, Ya Rasulullah, anuhlaku wa fina salihun. Will we be destroyed and there's still righteous people amongst us? 
will piety not save us? And our Prophet ﷺ said, Naam, إِذَا كَثُرُ الْخَبَثِ Yes, even if there's still pious people, but if filth is prevalent everywhere, the piety of some individuals will not protect you. It might protect them on Judgment Day. It might protect them. In fact, it will protect them on Judgment Day. But societies will not be protected when corruption and evil and fitna and licentiousness and nudity and fahisha is rampant everywhere. The piety of a few folks will not prevent the adab of Allah from coming. Nasrullah salama wal afiyah. If you understand this hadith, then you should make sure you are at least pious. So this hadith tells us that Ya'juj and Ma'juj's wall has a hole this size in the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Hadith in Tirmidhi in which Abu Huraira narrates that every single day Ya'juj and Ma'juj try to dig out and every day they are met with an angel and the angel tells them enough for today go back and so they go back until finally on the final day the angel mentions the famous phrase inshallah come back and the next day when they come back so the the narration is very long it basically means every day they come back and they find all of the work that they have done goes back to nothing they have to start from the beginning again until the last day when they find they come back the work of yesterday is still there they still are carved in so now they start from where they left off and they break through so this is a hadith that mentions that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are carving every day and that every single day they get to a place until the angel turns them uh, back in another hadith in Sahih Muslim we learn that after the Dajjal is killed, Isa will congratulate his followers and give con con consolation to his followers. And within that time frame or a very short time frame, Allah will inspire Isa that a new group has come. Ibad Ali. Creations of mine have come. No one can fight them. No one can fight them. So take my servants and go to Jabal Tur, go to Mount Tur and protect them over there. Then Allah will send Ya'juj and Ma'juj out and so Isa and the Muslims will not see them. They will be protected in the caves of Tur Sayna somewhere. Wherever Musa was or in that region, they will be protected over there. Now, in this hadith, we learn that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are so dangerous, so evil, that Allah Himself says, nobody can fight them. Interestingly enough, this army has just fought the Dajjal. This army has just fought the Dajjal, and they have won over the Dajjal. And they are told, you cannot fight Ya'juj and Ma'juj. In fact, it is so bad that Allah protects them even from seeing Ya'juj and Ma'juj. They just flee by the command of Allah before Ya'juj and Ma'juj come. They find protection in the caves that Allah tells them to find protection in before Ya'juj and Ma'juj come and they remain in those caves. For how long? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And in fact, in one narration, uh, it mentions that uh, Isa and his followers, they will seek refuge in a cave for so long that the, the, the what is the, the term I'm looking for? The head of a ram, the head of a goat, the head of a ram, a dead ram, will be more precious to them than 100 gold dinars. Now the head of a ram is almost useless. It has no meat. It has nothing you can benefit from. You throw it to the side. But they will be in the cave for so long that that head will be more precious to them than a hundred gold coins. A fortune. They have nothing to eat and drink until finally when they notice whatever they notice. We don't know. The hadith doesn't mention. Maybe there's quiet. Maybe there's something. They will say, who can go and volunteer and see what is going on outside the cave?
So a man will volunteer. He will be considered the best of them. And he will resign himself to die the death of a shaheed. He's given up that he's going to die the death of a shaheed. And he will come out only to see that the world is full of corpses of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The world is full of corpses of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And then he will call out the people and they will come out and they will see not a single hand span of the earth except that it is piled with Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the world will stench. There will be a stench that they cannot bear from Ya'juj and Ma'juj's body. So they will desperately plead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this. And Allah Azza wa Jal will send a rain that will cleanse the earth, a cleansing that it has never had before. Deep cleansing from Allah Azza wa Jal. In another narration, Allah will bring a special type of bird that will pick up their bodies and take them away. So we have the removal of the corpses, then we have a special rain that will wash away the remnants as well. So this is another tradition from uh, Sunan At-Tirmidhi. We also have, we also have in Musnad Imam Ahmad, the, 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 the phrase which is also in other books as well, that Allah Azza wa Jal will send Ya'juj and Ma'juj and they will descend from every single plane. وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِنُوا This Quranic verse. And they will pass by At-Tabariya. And they will drink from At-Tabariya. It's a massive lake. We'll mention which one it is in a while. And by the time the last of them passes by, there will be no water in the lake of Tabariya. And the last batch will say, there used to be water over here. And Isa and his followers will remain trapped in a cave until the head of a lamb is more precious than a hundred gold coins. As I mentioned this also in Tirmidhi. Then they will make dua to Allah to save them from Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So Allah will send a disease against them. Ya'juj and Ma'juj would not be killed with the sword. Allah will send a disease against them that will attack their necks and they will die the death of one person. When one of them dies, all of them die. It is a simultaneous death. The death of one person. These billions or millions or hundreds of millions of people, they will die instantaneously the death of one person. The death of one person and then this man will come out. The hadith goes on the back to the one that I mentioned. The man will come out terrified, scared. He will find everybody is already dead. Then Isa will come out. They will find not a single space to stand except the bodies will be rotting. So Isa will make dua again. So Allah will send birds with the necks of Bakhtari camels. Bakhtari camels, the Bactrian camels, the camels that have these U-shaped necks. There will be birds like this. Massive birds will come. Maybe Tayran Ababi something like this they will take them and then throw them wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills so this is another narration yet another narration yet another narration Ya'juj and Ma'juj will conquer everybody in this earth they will kill everyone pause here footnote who will they kill clearly not the followers of Isa so the remnants of the army of Dajjal anybody who fled and was not caught any human beings that have not embraced Allah and believed in Isa at this point in time, these will now be destroyed by Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So Ya'juj and Ma'juj will conquer the world. And they will get to Tur. And Tur is where Isa is. They will get to Tur. In one narration, they will get to the Jabal of Quds, the mountain of Quds. Is this Mount Olives? Is this the mount that is in front of um, Aqsa? In that region they will be. And they will find nobody to conquer. They've conquered everybody. So one of them will say, we have conquered the inhabitants of this world. Let us conquer the inhabitants of the heavens. So they will throw an arrow towards the heavens. And Allah will cause the arrow to come back full of blood. In another narration, they will wave their spears towards the heavens and Allah will cause their spears to come back with blood. And so they will say, we have now conquered those in the heavens. Then Isa will make the dua and then they will be uh, destroyed. Now, this lake Tabariya, most of our commentators 
mention that this is the Lake Tiberius, the Lake Tiberius. And this is also called by the Christians the famous Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, okay? And to this day, it is called Tabariya by the Palestinians and the Arabs of that region. Tabariya, it is called the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee, it is a massive, massive lake. It is a massive amount of water. It has fed the crops and the people for two, three thousand years. What group is Ya'juj and Ma'juj that in one generation that lake which has given mankind water for two, three thousand years will be gone? Think about that. How much will this group drink? How much will they? I mean, I have seen Tabari, like many of you, Tabari, many of you have been to the Sea of Galilee. If you go to that land, you see it. You can, it's like a mini ocean. That's why it's called the Sea of Galilee. It's like a mini ocean, even though it's not a sea technically, but it looks like it. It's massive. You can barely see. I mean, you can see, but you can barely see the end. This all water will be gone in one group? How? Think about this. It's very strange. How can it go? But this is what the hadith says. Also, what type of enemy is this? That the people of Isa haven't even seen them. What type of enemy that they cannot physically even fight them? I mean, are they not humans? We're going to come to this. Because they fought the Jal and his people and they were human. What is going on here? That they are not even seeing them. The man who's going to go see them is thinking he's going to die just by looking at them. He's already made up his mind, I'm a shaheed, I'm going to die. He volunteers the death of a shaheed, like oh, there's no way I'm going to be coming back. So we also have in a number of uh, traditions as well, what demonstrates their quantity, is that the Prophet ﷺ said that the Muslims will use the weapons and the armor of Ya'juj and Ma'juj for many years to come. So they will get this stuff. In one hadith, in Muslim Ibn Muhammad, he said, the beasts of the earth will grow fat and feed themselves for many years from Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So the corpses will be so much that Ya'juj and Ma'juj will fertilize the earth. And from this fertilization, there shall be a time of great opulence in terms of food. Perhaps the most opulent time in the history of mankind will take place. Where our Prophet ﷺ said, one pomegranate, one Ruman will feed an entire tribe. And one leg of lamb will be enough for a large group of people. In other words, things are going to change. Small quantities, or maybe it's not small, maybe the Ruman will be a massive amount. Maybe things are going to change. And again, we're going to come back to these interpretations because they're all cryptic phrases and perhaps we can rethink through them if only to save the iman of our young men and women who are rethinking through these things as well. In, Musa, in Sunan ibn Majah, the Prophet ﷺ said, when you see this happen, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, when you see Ya'juj and Ma'juj happen, then expect the hour to come. Expect judgment day. Expect qiyamah. Just like the pregnant lady at the end of her labor is just waiting for the cry and she surprises the family when she goes into the pangs of labor. In other words, at that very end stage, right? Everybody's waiting, waiting, waiting. When will the water break? When will the pangs begin? And when it happens, everybody goes into panic mode. The Prophet gave this example. When you see Ya'juj and Ma'juj, this is the pregnant lady about to give birth. Nobody knows exactly when, but it's on Alert. Oh, husbands, remember that time frame of your life, huh? 24-hour alert, remember that? That is what the Prophet is talking about. That, those of you who are not married, make dua, make it easy, inshallah. <laughs> that, at that time frame, you're just waiting. When is it going to happen? You're anxious. What's it? So the Prophet is giving a metaphor that every family knows this. That time frame is tense. You don't know, you're expecting. So the Prophet said, when you see Ya'juj and Ma'juj, that's the time frame just like that pregnant lady will be given uh, birth at that time. Let the power of media improve your connection to your deen and make a positive impact on your life. Download the One Islam TV app today and embark on a transformative journey of knowledge, inspiration, and spiritual growth.